a couple, a male and female, they were sitting by a playground area where there was a soccer field where other people were playing soccer and they were just minding their business when one of them approached them and said, we are short of one female player. Could you play for us? She says, I don't know anything about soccer, but we need you, we need you. So insistent that she had no choice but to go. But as she was entering, she turned around and asked her boyfriend, what, what do I do? I don't know how to play, what, what's soccer? So he said, well, you just use your head and your upper body, your legs, of course, but no hands. And while she went into play, he went out to run some errands, and when he came back, he was so shocked to find, the story goes, that she had to go into emergency when asked why. The other players came up to him and said, I don't understand, your girlfriend was goalie, and she kept using her head every time the ball went. She just used her head, used her head. She got injured. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the wrath of God. The word itself, wrath itself, is just wrathful. It's scary. The wrath of God. We want to look at the first chapter of Romans, and I'm not sure how many verses we can get to, but we want to start with verse 18. Let us look at that on screen. Read with your eyes. Allow me to read out loud. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. Ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged their glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Amen. The gospel message begins with a statement about the wrath of God. And it is important for us here, those of us who are attending Salah tonight, to know that in order to fully appreciate and understand the love of God, we must first understand the wrath of God. Today's contemporary evangelism purposely avoids that theme. Rarely judgment comes up in evangelism attempts. Talking about abundant living, love, peace, etc. Admittedly, the subject of the wrath of God is a tough one. It is not an easy topic to talk about. Recently, as of late, the topics that we've been covering are all tough, but especially the judgment of God, the wrath of God, is not an easy topic to talk about. But how can they understand anything about the love without understanding God's hate? How can they understand grace if they do not know the law or forgiveness if not the penalty of that law? How can they seek grace and salvation without understanding damnation and hell? They are inseparable. You cannot escape it. The wrath of God is exemplified in the Old Testament against the world in the flood. In the Old Testament, God poured forth His wrath on the world against the Tower of Babel, against Sodom and Gomorrah against the Egyptians and many times against Israelites and against the enemies of Israel and all those ungodly people and unrighteousness, God poured out his wrath. That's the Old Testament, but God does not change. When it comes to the New Testament, that person by the name of John, 
In John chapter 3, he who is the man of love who talked about the beauty of Christ and the love of Christ and the gentleness of Christ, and he's the one who put his head against the bosom of Jesus. He's the one who himself said of himself that he is the disciple whom the Lord Jesus loved the most. He writes in chapter 3, verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Very simply put, it is not well with those who reject Christ. So when you are evangelizing, witnessing, or sharing the gospel, if you give them that if you accept Christ, you are going to have this, that, prosperity, you're going to have fun and peace and excitement and all of that, if you neglect to tell them the wrath of God, number one, without Christ, they will be damned forever. And secondly, even if they receive salvation, they would not be fully able to appreciate the fullness of the gospel because it tells us, it contrasts how much God has to come down in order to give us salvation. We have to accept both the attribute of love and also the wrath, the attribute of his justness. And they are equally, equally holy. God does not punish anybody unjustly. You and I, when we become angry at someone or something, a lot of times our emotion gets in the way. A lot of times our pride gets in the way. So we do not see the whole picture. God is always right and just in his judgment. Let us take a look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. Ephesians 5, 6 let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons or children of disobedience. The wrath of God is surely coming. Do not let people tickle your ears with sweet talk, because the sons of disobedience, they will be heavily judged by the wrath of God. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, we are told that God and the judge Christ will become in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. He will come like a fire, inflicting vengeance. Good news is nothing without the bad news. You have to diagnose the disease before the cure. You need to know what we are working with. We need to know what kind of spiritual condition we are in before crying out, save me. If you're half drowning, you're not going to be as desperate as if you knew that no one is coming to save you, you are at the bottom, there is no help to be found, you are going to be more passionate and desperate, and that is exactly where God wants us to be. Blessed are the poor in spirit, absolutely bankrupted spiritually. I have nothing to save myself. I have no capability of saving myself. That's because we are all doomed. We were born as children of disobedience. So verse 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. In Ephesians chapter two, let us look at verses one, two, three. Ephesians two, one, two, three. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So we are clearly told that we were born from birth. We were born into this world as sinners, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We're no different. We were born into this world with sin. 
the only reason that we are called children of God is not because of our goodness, not because we've done anything good, but that God decided in his infinite wisdom to choose us, called us, and he gave us faith that is required in salvation. That is why we were able to call out to God. That is why we were able to say, Lord, save me. How can a dead person come alive until someone else resuscitates him to life? How can, therefore, likewise, a spiritually dead person who cannot come to life unless someone else outside of himself, outside of herself, who will spiritually resuscitate that person to spiritually come back to life? A dead person cannot come back to life. A spiritually dead person cannot come back to spiritual life. We were dead. The only reason that you and I are acknowledging the presence of God, the only reason that we are able to seek the things of God and have an appetite for the things spiritually is that God awakened us. He quickened our spirit. He was the one who visited us, opened our hearts, gave us his Holy Spirit. That is why without whom the Holy Spirit, no one can say Jesus is Lord. The fact that you are saying, Jesus, you're my Lord, proves that you are his child, that God has given you salvation. Everyone born into this world as a child of wrath, born spiritually dead. The whole human race has been damned to hell already. But the world does not want to hear about hell and wrath of God, judgment. What kind of wrath is this? First of all, it is divine wrath. It is godly wrath. It is the wrath that comes from God. It is the wrath of God. Not like when you and I get mad or angry. When we get offended by something or someone, we get angry, we retaliate, we want to fight, and we have this vengeance on our hearts. God is not like that. We must not use our way and calculate that, thinking that God is the same way. God's wrath is always righteous, always holy, always perfect. God cannot tolerate iniquity. The more godlike you and I become, the more angry you and I will get also of sin and unrighteousness. The reason that when we see injustice in the world, the reason that when we see all kinds of sinfulness in the world and we don't really get passionate about it, we don't really feel bad about it, is that we have a long way to go. We are not Christ-like. We're not God-like as we should be. Sometimes we do get mad about certain injustice. Some of us might get angry at all the aborted babies. Some of us might get angry at all the people who take advantage of little children. Sometimes we get angry at people who abduct children and so on and so forth. Sometimes we do get mad about certain injustices in the world. But God is infinitely beyond that, not polluted by sinfulness. You and I are somehow covered by sin. And so therefore, our eyes cannot see clearly. Our hearts cannot feel clearly. We cannot think with our minds clearly. So even when we get mad about certain injustices, we are really, we have other agendas, other issues. We are not righteous. We are not perfect. But God is in all of his judgment. So what kind of wrath is it? It is divine wrath. It is godly wrath, not our anger. So there's that difference. When is the time of God's wrath? Let's look at it again, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteous suppress the truth. And verse 19, if we can go there. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. And verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. In other words, God's power, God's existence, have been revealed from the beginning of time. Revealed, meaning constantly revealed, 
The word revealed comes from the word which we get apocalypse. Apocalypse, which means to uncover, to bring to light, to make known. He has revealed himself from the creation. He has revealed himself ever since the creation of time. It has revealed in the garden when Adam was given the glory of God and somehow God appeared to him in some kind of a light we cannot fully understand or explain. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve saw the presence of God in a way that Adam and Eve were able to see, perceive it was some form of light in the Garden of Eden. And yet when they ignored God and disobeyed him, immediately there was the sentence of death. The earth was cursed. They were thrown out. God cannot allow evil or sin to enter his presence. He is so holy that he cannot allow. As much as his love, he is equally just. He is equally holy. He is equally righteous. Therefore, even though he is forgiving, loving, and compassionate, and, and all those good, positive attributes, he is just as equally in his attributes. All of these other things that we do not like to talk about. His revelation has been given in the flood of drowning of everyone except eight people and the drowning of Pharaoh's army. God has been revealed in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah where fire from heaven came down destroying those cities. It has been revealed in the institution of the sacrificial system. In fact, the whole creation is groaning, waiting for its liberation. When we come to the eighth chapter of Romans, the entire creation or the universe is in frustration, groaning, waiting for its liberation for God, the Redeemer through Christ, will come to us and to reclaim, recreate the universe and undo this curse that this universe is under right now. Not only has through Adam and Eve sinned and therefore got kicked out, and as a result, you and I all are in this situation having inherited the initial original sin, the ground that they walked on, the earth is cursed. That is how we explain away the volcanoes that's happening in Hawaii and elsewhere. That is how we explain the typhoons and hurricanes and all the natural disasters because the earth, or, or so-called nature, to use a word or vocabulary that the world uses, the nature is cursed. God wills that this nature will continue to go on decaying until Christ returns. So it has to get worse and worse and worse. More earthquakes, more famines, more tornadoes, you name it, it's going to be worse and worse. The whole creation groans in anticipation of its liberation. Verse 20 tells us no one can plead ignorance. The greatest demonstration of the wrath of God ever given was on Calvary, the cross, when Jesus went to the cross, the greatest demonstration of the wrath of God is that even his own son cannot be allowed. That is, he has to let his son die because he cannot allow sin to go on. In order to get rid of the sin, he has to allow his son, punish his own son. I see in the world, no matter what your child does as a parent, no matter what your son or daughter does, you will always cover for them. They will not be blamed for anything as far as the parent is concerned. The world may say whatever, but the parent will continue till their dying moment that their children, their child is innocent, even fully knowing how evil they are, still they will hold on to their children, and yet our God Almighty let go of his only begotten son. His wrath was totally, his fury was unleashed on his begotten son. Like the dam that you see, like the Hoover Dam, so much water comes in, but not all the water comes in at once. It is kind of Reserved. It's waiting until it is time for that water to be used. 
ever since the time of creation, ever since Christ is dying on the cross, it is as though all of our sins have been piling up, waiting. It's been waiting, it's been piling up in one day, just as God brought the earth through a flood, destroyed the earth, it will come again. What we have done, what has been accumulated, he's going to account at once. That is why when we ask the question, how come these evil people are not condemned? How come these evil people are eating and drinking and going to the beach and having a good time? How come nothing bad happens to them? We know that they're bad. We know that they're guilty, but they're just running around living their lives as if there are no consequences, but they're wrong. God is waiting for that moment, and when that time is ripened, he is going to judge the world once again. It's a scary thing to even think about. There are physical laws, as you know. There are many types of laws. Obviously, there are moral laws, there are traffic laws, the human physical laws. Example, you jump off a tall building, it doesn't matter how good of an athlete you are, it doesn't matter how much faith you have, you are going to just be, shall I say, spat. You'll you'll die. It doesn't matter how much you can jump, It doesn't matter how many push-ups you can do. Physical laws is that whatever goes up must come down, and you cannot use your faith and be dumb about it. God, you're going to save me, aren't you? Jump off a plane without a parachute. You are probably, most likely, that is more than 1,000% be dead. If you are driving 100 miles per hour and hit a concrete wall, likewise. It doesn't matter of your driving skills. It doesn't matter how strong your car is you're going to die. That's the physical law. But there's also this law called spiritual law, the law of consequence. It is an inevitability. It is something that must happen. Sin must pay the price. It has to be paid. That is why the wrath of God must come. It is one of those things that are a no-brainer. This must happen. The world has to be reclaimed to himself. This world has to be recreated like unscrolling. He is going to descroll the creation. It was scrolled out. Now in the second coming, he's going to descroll his universe and the entire creation will be recreated. The law of consequence. Who are going to be the recipients of this wrath? Let's look at it again in verse 18. He says, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The wrath here, it refers to those who lack reverence or worship. Those who lack reverence, worship, and devotion. Sin is to the soul what rust is to gold, what stain is to beauty. Sin is so evil, so bad, that God cannot tolerate it. Just because God cannot tolerate evil, we must not say of him that he is not loving. We like to talk about love and joy and peace and comfort and all of that. Whenever we talk about judgment and wrath of God, we shy away. That must not be. God is both angry and he is both forgiving at the same time. He is both equally perfect in either case. Well, we say, I'm basically a good person. Let me tell you, nobody can escape his wrath. Inescapability. No one can escape. God's standard is so high, a lot of times we say, Lord, why can't you lower the standard a little bit? If he said to us, Only the smartest would enter the kingdom of God. What would happen to those people whose IQs are like my average bowling score, double digits? People like me would not be able to enter the kingdom of God if he said only the smartest can come into my kingdom. If he said only the wealthiest would come into the kingdom, what about the poor people? They would not be able to come into the kingdom of God. So he says, nobody deserves to come into the kingdom. Nobody. Therefore, his standards are so high, nobody can reach it. Nobody can attain it. Everybody, no exception, is in need. Everybody's in need of his grace. Whether you are one of the wealthiest, richest, or smartest, you still need 
the grace of God, every one of us. That's the standard of God. And the last one that I want to talk about before closing is this. How can God hold all these poor people responsible? People often say, I did not choose to be born. I did not choose to come out into the world. I did not choose to be born from a family that is not Christian. How come you are holding me responsible? People are constantly attempting to suppress the truth by their sin, the Bible says. Listen again. Let's read again. For the wrath of God, verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They suppress the truth constantly. A lot of times we say, what about those people who have never heard the gospel? I can tell you that God has given both general revelation, which is things that we see around the world, and special revelation, which is the word of God. The Israelites ignore both. They ignore the things in the world, and they also ignore the scriptures. Those people who have never heard the gospel, again, God is always justified in his decision. He is not going to send someone to hell without right justification. The Bible tells us that every one of us has been given this revelation to know God. In nature, we have this conscience that God has given us. Every one of us, we have the truth, only we suppress it. We want to be God. We do away with God because we don't want God to tell us what to do. We know God exists, but we do away with him because we want to be making all the decisions. But ultimately, what that will lead is emptiness. And that emptiness, it leads to human moral deficiency, and it just becomes decaying, and one is left with the need of something to fulfill that insufficient thing. And so they constantly are in need of this creating something else outside of themselves. We call it religion. So they create idols. They create images because they suppress the truth, saying that what they are doing is right even though it's wrong. They try to justify everything that they're doing, and they say, we're good, we're good, I'm good, I'm good, when in fact they're not. And so they have this guilt conscience, so religion is created. But again, religion, as I said before, damns more people Nothing damns more people than religion because it gives people false hope. It gives them false assurance that by worshiping a bird or insect or creeping things or whatever it is, a wooden image or whatever you have, they think that there is salvation. The fool is always saying there is no God because if there is a God, he's in big trouble. So in order to get away from the judgmental God, which is inevitable, they create something else so that they do not have to face God because once they face God, they know that they're doomed. Uh Uh-oh is going to be their favorite word. The knowledge of God is all over. God has revealed himself to every individual. No matter how remote they are, they are without excuse. You cannot go to God and say, I was never told about God. I was never told God will judge them on the basis of whatever limited knowledge they have. Just as little infants when they die, my personal opinion on that is that God is going to save them. But I could be wrong. I cannot be dogmatic because even a child is born into the world as hard as it is for me to say they are born with sinful nature. But outside of the infants who never even saw the daylight, they, let's say, are dead even while coming out, even inside of the mother's womb, our loving God cannot possibly send them to hell. But the Bible is silent on that subject, so I cannot be dogmatic. How can a God blame somebody that has not heard the gospel? Well, he is going to judge on the basis of what they have been given. Some people are less intelligent to understand, but the gospel is so simple. But yet there are some people who are born who have such a low IQ and have very, very little capability of understanding the truth. Well, to them, God will judge them on that basis. You know the story of Helen Keller, the mute, deaf, and blind? 
She was not able to communicate anything until Ann Sullivan comes by and time after time, day after day, week after week, month after month, teaches her how to communicate, and when she tries to demonstrate the existence of God, what does Helen respond? She says, I already know God, I just do not know his name. Isn't that incredible how God can reveal himself to anyone? Everybody has been given his revelation, but we simply suppress the truth. God has stored his wrath against all the sins behind the dam of his patience. And he has let it out once at Calvary, and he's going to do it again one day. God never judges unless judgment is deserved. God is the God of absolute justice. There is not going to be any one individual on the day of judgment who will be able to say, oh, you missed this one. They deserve hell, but me, I'm a special case. There would not be any, any individual on that day. Many years ago, my family and I were driving in downtown LA. It was rush hour, about eight o'clock in the morning. There were lots of buses stopping, coming in, stopping, pulling out. I was behind this bus, and this bus, even though apparently saw me there, they're bullies. The bus came right in front of my lane. It was going to hit me, so what did I do? I swerved to another lane. Of course, I looked quickly from my side view mirror that there was enough space for me to make that move. So I moved over to the next lane about halfway, and then once the bus passed, I came back in. There was a motorcycle police officer who pulled me over. And he wanted me to sign the citation. Of course, I didn't want to. I felt like I was innocent. I had to do what I had to do. It wasn't my fault, but the bus came in. So he put his hand on his gun to his side as if, I'm going to use this gun if you don't sign it. In those days, they had lots of authority, much, much more so than I think today. In Korea, people are just run over. They curse at the cops and they do all that. They do much less here, but anyway. To make the short story longer, I decided to go to court. With my wife's help, I came in with lots of documents, took pictures and all that, and we came up with this law that's called double jeopardy. And so I took all that and went to the court. There were cops and other people there, and the judge called each one's name, and each time their names were called, they were found guilty, 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 next, guilty, next. And about 10 to 15 people went by, and I was about to be called next. And, and I knew, I, what, am, what am I going to say? When he called my name, I went up there, how do you plead? I said, not guilty. So you have any proof? I was hoping, number one, that the police officer wouldn't show up, but he was there. So he came, and I was dressed in a suit, and I basically said, I had to do what I had to do. It was going to come hit me. I had to move over to the other lane. And so the judge asked the police motorcyclist, police officer, did you see him? And he said, no, I didn't see him. That really got him in trouble. You mean to say that you couldn't tell whether that car was doing the right thing or not? So the judge was not totally convinced, so I gave him this paper. Judge, and I was teaching this judge, there's a law called double jeopardy. He goes, what's that? Well, that's the rule that says if somebody jeopardizes your life, you can then jeopardize someone else to save your own life. So he looks at the paper, it was highlighted, he looks and he goes, Mr. Sun, you're not guilty. So yeah, after all those people who were found guilty, not guilty. So as I was coming down the elevator, all happy, these other people came into the elevator with me. They looked at me in my suit and they said, are you an attorney? I go, no, I'm a pastor. <laughs> but I think that some people think that going to the judgment seat of Christ, they would have an option of guilty or not guilty. My point is that there's not going to be any individual whatsoever that can say, my life is innocent. I had nothing to do with my disobedience to you. I had nothing to do with my lack of faith. I was born into a Buddhist family. I had no knowledge of Christ. I am innocent. And on that day, obviously, Jesus would say, you are a goat, go over there. How are you these days? What are you doing to prepare for his coming? I want you to be balanced in your perception of God's salvation. 
Yes, he's loving, forgiving, merciful, but also understand where we have come from, that we were born into being children of disobedience. We were children of the devil. That's where we were. He has brought us out from that into light. Amen.